um, x to the fourth plus y to the fourth equals z squared in the integers implies x times y times z is equal to zero. Oh, the only solutions to the Pythagorean equation are the trivial. Proof. If not, then x squared squared plus y squared squared equals z squared is a Pythagorean triple. If it's not a primitive Pythagorean triple, if need be, if the GCD, if the greatest common divisor of x, y, and z is equal to d, then um, x over d, y over d, z over d squared is primitive. Proof. So this is the claim. This is a claim. Proof. Let's leave that as an exercise. So this is exercise number one. For the, for the I forget what number we stopped at last time. So let's let's call this one. Okay, if the greatest common divisor, if we had some, some common factor, then we can remove the common factor. So now assume, after doing uh, this division by d, by d, and by d squared, we can assume that uh, the, the solution is primitive and in fact pairwise primitive. That x, y, z is pairwise primitive. In fact, let's make that part of the exercise. Not just primitive, but pairwise primitive. And everybody understands the distinction between the two. Yes, good. Assume x, y, z is pairwise primitive. Um, then what? Then we have a pairwise primitive Pythagorean triple. Charles? Uh, you can um, turn it to uh, R and S. Yes, so by the parametrization. The parametrization theorem from last time. Thank you, Will. I'm going to do this. This and this. Right, by the parametrization theorem, I'm still hoping to see the, the uh, Pythagorean equation. There exist co prime. R and S of opposite parity, opposite parity. Right, um, I have to choose one of these to be even because they're pairwise co-prime. Let's say Y is the even one. So there exists co-prime R and S of opposite parity with, so R and S parametrize X squared, Y squared, and Z. Because x squared y squared z was our Pythagorean triple. x squared is r squared minus s squared. y squared is 2rs. z is r squared plus s squared. So far, so good. OK. r and s are co-prime. And let's move this to look like x squared plus s squared equals r squared. R and S are co-prime, that means X S R is a Devendra. Primitive Pythagorean triple. Primitive Pythagorean triple. And S is the even one, because X is already the odd one. So S has to be the even one. So what? Let's use the parametrization again, exactly as Karen said. Use the parametrization theorem again. There exist co-prime integers u and v of opposite parity. 
so that x, <coughs> s, and r are parameterized by u squared plus v squared, x is u squared minus v squared, and s is 2uv. So far, so good. Now, we already know that S and R are co-prime. So in particular, U and V have no prime factors in common with U squared plus V squared. Let's go back to Y squared equals, let's go back to this equation. That's the one we haven't used yet. We've used this equation to come up with U and V. Now let's go back to this equation to connect this all the way back to the original equation. The original equation was uh, x to the fourth plus y to the fourth equals z e squared. So y squared is equal to 2rs, so that's 2rs. Now y is even, so let's say y is equal to twice y1, where y1 is an integer. So now we have 4y1 squared is equal to 4u times v times u squared plus v squared. And these are three co-prime integers whose product is a perfect square. Who's with me? Who's lost? Kevin, thank you for your honesty, please. I guarantee you there are other people that are lost, they're just too scared to raise their hand. Where did I lose you? Which step? Uh, the, step that you just said. The, st the thing that I just said. I didn't write the thing that I just said yet, so it's okay to be lost. What I said is, um, here we, so we, when we cancel the fours, we have a perfect square on this side, and we have a product of three numbers, which have no prime factors in common. So this number is a perfect square, so let's say 3 squared divides this number. Where does that 3 squared go? It can only go in one of these three places. It can't be distributed among them. So that means the 3 squared, let's say, goes into u. Maybe a 5 to the 6th divides this. That 5 to the 6th can't go 5 cubed, 5 cubed. It has to go 5 to the 6th in one place only. But that means each of these numbers has an even, whatever primes divide it, divides it to even powers which is exactly what it means for each of these numbers to themselves be perfect squares. So three co-prime numbers multiply to a perfect square if and only if each of them is a, itself a perfect square. Where did y equals um, two y one come That's just that y is even. Oh, okay. I'm just using the fact that y, at the very beginning, one of them had to be declared even. We said, let's suppose y is the even one, x is the odd one. So if y is even, that's just to take care of this factor four. So this factor 4 has to go somewhere. Actually, it's already there because we have a 2 and a 2. <coughs> Does that make sense? These are all co-prime, pairwise co-prime, pairwise co-prime, and this is a perfect square. Just another way of saying it is a square. That implies that these are each themselves squared. U is equal to a squared, v is equal to b squared, and u squared plus v squared is equal to c squared. And now what? Will, you had something? Uh, I mean, after this misled, you would then solve C. Right. So now we have that C squared is equal to A to the fourth plus B to the fourth. <coughs> so we have a new solution to the original equation. And I claim that C, so the, the final claim, the final claim is that if none of these were trivial, if no solution is trivial, if uh, x, y, if x times y 
times z, if x times y times z does not equal zero, then c is strictly, then c is strictly less than z. So let's go back over the proof and, and see if you can see this claim. In fact, maybe I'll leave the proof of this claim as an exercise, but let me do the exercise for you and then you can think about it again. So, this, so I'll leave this as an exercise. This is exercise two. Because this is really, really important. Exercise two, prove this claim. But let me tell you in words why it's what's going on, okay? So let's go back over our, our argument. We started with x, y, z. Now, r is not equal to s, and r and s, not, neither of them are 0. right? That the assumption that y is not equal to 0 means r and s are not 0. The assumption that x is not 0 means y, r and s are not in absolute value equal. So because they're not equal in absolute value, I mean, what can happen is, um, I claim that r, that z is strictly larger than r squared. Well, there's a couple of there's a couple of cases you have to think about. So if s is zero, then z is exactly equal to r squared. And actually, you're not reducing the the size of the equation. But if if s is not zero, then then this is some positive amount. So z is strictly less than r squared. So there's some cases you have to think about. What 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 happens if um, if s is not zero, and what happens if uh, r and s are not of the same size? Charlie? Uh, if s is zero, then y squared is zero, which means um, x times y times z is zero. Exactly. That's not what we want, right? So. Uh, that's, that's, that's exactly the argument we want to show that c is strictly less than. Let's look back at what c is. Let's, let's work backwards in the proof. What is c? c is a to the fourth plus b to the fourth. What was a, a to the fourth and b to the fourth? That was u squared plus v squared. In fact, u squared plus v squared, u squared plus v squared is nothing more than r. So u squared plus v squared is r. What we've shown is that r, this is equal to, this is equal to r. The whole point of the argument was that r is itself a square. And so my claim is that c is actually uh, less than z. How could it not be less than z? Well, that would be the case if r was itself of size z squared. And how could r be of size z squared if r is equal to z squared and z is equal to r squared plus s squared? You have to mess around with that a little bit and see that uh, if s is equal to zero, then um, then you're not uh, decreasing the solution. So that's another exercise, by the way. Um, there's a point one zero. Let's let's look at the point. Uh, let's see, four zero two. Four zero two is a point on this variety. Uh, other way around, two zero four. Two to the fourth power is sixteen plus zero is equal to four squared. Okay? So exercise exercise three. Exercise three. Exercise exercise three. This is really, really important. Uh, set X Y Z <coughs> equal to what did we say? Two zero four? What is, compute, what are all of the other variables? R, S, U, V, A, B, C. Okay, compute all of the other variables in the case X, Y, Z is equal to two, zero, four. And you'll see, this is a hint for how to do exercise two for how to follow through and find why C decreases. And now we're almost done. Now comes the descent part of the argument. This is the, the slickest idea 
and, and everything that we've discussed so far. Everything else was kind of pushing around equations. Here's Fermat's idea. So, if there exists x, y, z uh, on this variety with x to the 4 plus y to the 4 equals z squared, primitive, then there exists ABC primitive with uh, primitive and non-trivial, primitive uh, with x, y, z not equal to zero, then there exists, so if there exists x, y, z, non-trivial solution, with x to the fourth plus y to the fourth equals z, to z squared primitive, then there exists an ABC primitive with same equation, a to the fourth plus b to the fourth equals c squared, uh, and ABC not equal to zero, and C strictly less than Z. That's the culmination of the argument. So now imagine, imagine this, this variety, x to the fourth, so here's, here's R3. What does this look like? x to the fourth plus y to the fourth equals Z squared. So x squared plus y squared equals Z, Z squared was a cone. This is some ordic, I don't know what this hypersurface looks like. Well, the level sets will be some kind of ovally looking things. Okay, and there's a negative Z whenever there's a positive. So, so this is the, let's call this variety. So this is the variety X to the four plus Y to the four minus Z squared, the level set of this thing equal to zero. And this is V of R. Now we have some trivial points. The trivial points are where one of the variables is equal to zero. So that's here we know we have integer points in the um, x equals zero plane and in the y equals zero plane and in the z equals zero point is the point zero, zero, zero. And here's some more points. So these are the integer points. So this is v of z, the integer points of the variety. Now suppose we had a non-trivial solution. If there's something, this is a hypothetical, hypothetical non trivial solution. I guess I'm taking z to be positive. I mean, by symmetry, we can, we can just think about the positive numbers. So maybe I shouldn't draw it here, where, where z is negative, but up there. But I, too late. You know what I mean. Do you know what I mean? Or put absolute values on these. Maybe that's an even better thing to do. Okay? Or just think about what's going on in the upper uh, part of this coordinate. So what we showed is that if there exists a hypothetical solution, then there's one with a smaller c. Strictly smaller. Then there's one with an even strictly smaller c. Then there's one with an even strictly smaller c. No matter what, there's always one with a strictly smaller c. But that means eventually we have to get all the way down to the absolute smallest c which is not in R, we're in Z. Yes, exactly. That's exactly the point. That's why we're doing number theory. We, are, we, want, to do, we want to study whole number solutions. Okay, so the point is, uh, this is Fermat's descent. Fermat's descent argument. Descent idea. This continues until continue uh, and there's an actual bound you know if you started with z equals a million or something this can only continue for a million times you have to subtract at least one each time from from the value of c so there's a really finite amount of con uh, continuity a uh, no number of iterations that you have to do to this process continue until c equals zero but once c is equal to zero then you know what a and b are a to the fourth plus b to the fourth equals zero. Zero. And then if you look back at all of the equations, you never moved. That means when you move forward at all of the equations, you were always on zero, zero, zero. 
okay, implies always uh, had trivial solutions. So there's no way to jump from a non-trivial solution to a trivial solution, which means all along you were on trivial solutions. which means there, there were no, so this, this hypothetical non-trivial solution doesn't exist. Implies no non-trivial solutions. And if there are no non-trivial solutions to the equation, sorry, if there are no non-trivial solutions to the equation x to the fourth plus y to the fourth equals z squared, that means no non-trivial solutions to x to the fourth plus y to the fourth equals z to the fourth. And that is from Oz's last theorem to this exponent. Does that make sense? Pretty cool? We proved from Oz's last theorem? Well, a little tiny bit of it. All right. Any questions? Any questions on this? This argument, any questions on the exercises? Alex. How much bigger is the x to the n group? <laughs> uh, oh, almost infinitely bigger. It's much, 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 much more complicated than this. Uh, maybe at the very end, if we build up enough technology, we can have some kind of vague overview of, of it. In fact, there's a whole dis there was a recently a whole discussion about how there is probably no living human being that living or dead uh, that knows the entire proof from foundations to the end could pass a qualifying exam on, on the proof of Fermat without cheating at some point and using a black box. Even if they know how to use the black box, maybe they don't know the proof of the black box. Anyway, all right. Uh, the next thing Fermat did, which is important for us, is he turned his attention to, let's go back to, back to Pythagorean triples, back to x squared plus y squared equals z squared. And we saw that that means x is r squared minus s squared, y is 2rs, z is r squared plus s squared. So here's Fermat's question. What numbers are hypotenuses, what z's arise? I.e., what numbers occur as hypotenuses of right integer triangles? Now we know the answer, right? If z is a hypotenuse to a right integer triangle, then it's a sum of two squares. So really the question is, what numbers are sums of two squares? So let's, so, um, let's unpack this question even further, i.e., equivalently, let's q of x and y be the quadratic form, or maybe R and S. Let me, let me use R and S so that you don't get confused about which variables are which. Be R squared plus S squared. This is what's called a quadratic form. This, this is an example. Q is an example of a quadratic form. So homogeneous quadratic polynomial in some number of variables. Form just means homogeneous and quadratic. Okay? Uh, another, so another uh, quadratic form. Give me a Q1 in <coughs> R and S. What's a general quadratic form? And it's binary. The binary means there's only two variables. Ternary quadratic form would be if it was there an R and S and a T. Charles. Uh, 
R squared minus S squared? Yep, that's another one. How about 3 R squared uh, minus 2 R S plus 10 S squared? So that's another. Devendra? R times S. R times S is another one. Here's another. Another Q2 of RS is R times S. Yep, that's another quadratic. Charles? Uh, what's the difference between the quadratic and the homogeneous? Yes, the definition of a quadratic form is it's a homogeneous quadratic polynomial. So the degree here, we have R squared, the degree is 2. We have R times S, degree is 2. We have S squared, degree is 2. This is R times S, degree is 2. That's a dot, not a minus. Is that, is that the confusion? No, I just, no. Uh, I just thought like, homogeneous had to be like, all squares. But homogeneous means the total degree of each monomial. So the monomials are 3R squared, negative 2RS, and 10S squared. Each monomial has total degree. Two. So as long as any combination of the... Yep, any combination of R's and S's where uh, the total degree is two, you add them up, that makes a, a quadratic form. Here's another quadratic form. Uh, X squared plus Y squared minus Z squared is a quadratic form in X, Y, Z. So is, here's another quadratic form. Here's another example. Uh, another. These are all integer quadratic forms. The coefficients are, are integers. You could have rational quadratic forms. You could have irrational quadratic forms. So an irrational quadratic form is, uh, uh, let's call this Q3 of R and S and T and U is uh, pi R squared plus root 2 S T plus u squared. I don't know. You get the point. All that matters is this is degree 2, this is degree 2, this is degree 2, this is a constant, this is a constant, this is a constant. OK? That's all a quadratic form. It's a fancy word for uh, homogeneous quadratic polynomial. OK? So back to the question. The question is, what numbers are hypotenuses? So what numbers are represented, what whole numbers are represented by this quadratic form r squared plus s squared? What whole numbers, what whole numbers are represented as q of rs? So we're trying to solve the equation r squared plus s squared is equal to z. Which z's arise? All right, that's the question. Well, let's do this very naively. Does anyone know the answer already? Excellent, excellent. So we're all going to learn something. I'm not going to bore anybody. So here's the dumbest thing you're going to do. Uh, this is not an exercise, but homework. Please think about this over the weekend. Homework. Make a table that looks like this. R squared, S squared, and then their sum. and then there's some. So um, give me some squares. 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, and so on. As many as you feel like doing. 1, 4, 9, 16, 25. These are values of S squared. These are the values of R squared. And what are their sums? 1 plus 1? Yeah, this is easy. Just add 1 to this whole row, right? So this is 2, 5, 10, 17, 26, 37. How about adding 4 to everybody? Actually, it's going to be symmetric, so you only have to do the upper. Let's do half the work. You only have to do the upper triangular bit because whatever we do here is going to be the same here. In other words, I could just fill it. If you want to fill it all in, you can just copy whatever is happening on the upper 
right and put it in the bottom left. Did everybody see that? A little extra symmetry. Four plus four? Four plus nine? Four plus 16? Four plus 25? Four plus 36? Okay, uh, let's go over here, nine plus nine? 18, why did I skip this? Because it's already there. Uh, 9 plus 16, 9 plus 16, 25, hey, look at that, what is that? That's a perfect square, that's a Pythagorean triple. The Pythagorean triples are sitting in here as the squares that are also themselves sums of two squares. But now we're asking a more general question, what are all of these numbers? Okay, keep going, 9 plus 25, 34, 9 plus 36, 45, and so on, okay? So then you, you fill out this table and you look at which numbers do you see. So all the Z's, what do we see? What do we see? We see Z equals, well, zero squared plus zero squared, let's include that, no reason not to. We see Z, zero squared plus one squared. We see the number two, one squared plus one squared. Do we see the number three? No, three cannot be the sum of two squares. And if you think about it, you just look on your fingers. How do you make three a sum of two squares? Well, two squared is four, that's already too big. So all your, your only chances are zero and one, and zero and one's all up there. And it's either a zero, one, or a two. Does that make sense? So three's out. Three is not a sum of two squares, fine, who cares? Four, three. How about number four? Four is there. Because it's uh, 2 squared plus 0 squared. How about 4 <laughs> squared plus 1 squared? 5. Do we see a 6? No, we don't see 6. Curious. Do we see 7? No. Mess around and convince yourselves that 6 and 7 really are missing here. They can't be there. Do we see 8? Yes, 4 plus 4. Do we see 9? 0 plus 3 squared. 9 is there. Do we see 10? Yes. Yes, 9 plus 1. We see 10. Do we see 11? No. Do we see 12? Doesn't look like it. We do see 13. So what happened to 11 and 12? Maybe we didn't go far out enough? I don't know. Mess around. So make this list. And your homework is, well, you notice. Mess around with this list. Homework. Just for fun, to be thinking about this stuff, mess around with this list. Mess around, what do you notice? What do you notice? And that is what we will continue our discussion.